Now, Bruce, Bruce Sterling, who was a, you know, is a great science fiction author here in town, he was giving a, a talk at a GDC where he said, you know, the problem for me as a book author that, you know, if I'm trying to write the very best book ever written, which of course is his goal, mm -hmm. the probability of writing the best book ever is very low because there's been a lot of really good authors over a very long span of time. Sure. But if he managed to write the very best book ever, it would stand probably for many years. So for you guys with games, it's the opposite. He said, you know, the probability of writing the best game ever is actually fairly easy because there haven't been that many games. And the art form is getting better and better all the time. Sure. He said, worst part though is, is that even if you write the very best game ever written, not only will it not stand very long because somebody will write a better game here in the next few years, but even the machines to play those earliest great games on will not exist. Because, the, yeah, the media itself is always changing. Right. And from that day forward, once you told me that, I went, oh, I said, that's so sad. You know, I'm, I'm one of the few people that's still around that goes back to those very earliest days, and already I can't play my own games. Right. And so every, my own early games, and so ever since then, I went back and got my original Apple II's back on. I went and bought a bunch of spare parts that I keep up here on the walls. And, uh, and with those spare parts, I keep this sucker running. And, uh, and uh, usually every day it's here running a Calabath. Today we just did an office shuffle, so it's, uh, I haven't you know, put the disc back in and powered up. But it actually is, I uh, use here, it actually does, does power up. I just have to put the disc back in here uh, out of my collection to uh, get it all back online. Yeah, I played an Apple IIe when I first was learning computers. Um, we had an Apple IIe. This is probably older than that, but... Um, uh, yeah, Apple II Plus. And so uh, uh, I had an Apple II non-plus also, um, but uh, but upgraded as the first few came out. Right. And in fact, I wrote a Calabeth when there was only 13 sector disk drives. And I upgraded all my drives to 16 sector as the switch happened. And it was only this last month uh, that I found an old Apple II collector here in town that had some of the old ROMs from the 13 sector uh, drive so I could switch back to uh, 13 sector. So yeah. uh, this one's still 16 sector, but I, I have some others that are now 13 sector. Yeah, the only, the only game you could play on those things was like the Oregon Trail. Back know? in the early, yeah, yeah, in the earliest. In these, we had, uh, there were seven, uh, was it nine inch floppies? Oh no! That would so the uh, so seven, uh, uh, seven, uh, yeah, seven, seven inch floppies or something, yeah, something like that. Uh, these were five and a quarter. Yeah, five and a quarter and seven inch floppies. Yeah, and uh, and then uh, yeah, they're for for some of those other early, uh, you know, personal computers. Uh, they had the the larger floppies also. You could write more data on an index card by hand nowadays. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, literally. Well, in fact, you know, as you know, your cell phone's photograph is. Yeah way more memory than than any of this ever had just yeah. in one thick one photograph there's also a, a, one brief tangent you know being you you mean you've been into space those the computers on those space shuttles are actually very very as far as i remember oh, yeah, very rudimentary the, yeah even the ones on the latest shuttles were from the 80s yeah and so uh, yeah they were far 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 from modern so uh, but that's that's a good thing actually because they work and they know yeah. they work there's nothing wrong with them. Yes, they do math. I agree. Theor in theory, that's the theory, is uh, that they don't only put redundant systems on boards. So there were three identical machines that yeah. had to generally agree. Um, but uh, uh, by being literally old and tried and true meant that uh, hypothetically there'd be fewer issues. When I was on the ISS, you'll find this to be hilarious, at least I did. Um, every morning, there's, there's an activity that the whole crew goes through, which I thought was hilarious, which is... The first one of the first activities of every day is reboot all the PCs, <laughs> so they have a lower chance of blue screening. <laughs> because from those PCs, there turns out there, there's a network all through the ISS. Uh, there's sort of a high-level network which all the computers are on, and there's a low-level network mm -hmm. where all the thrusters are fired and all the safety stuff. And so the PCs are actually separate. So even if they yeah. do crash, it won't like kill everybody on board. Right. But the PCs are how you interface with that lower one. And uh, the, the, the PCs, which are all running Windows, oh my God. Uh, you know, have to be rebooted every day just to make sure you, uh, you know, clean everything up that might be hanging out in there. By all means, then, reboot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, here, let's do some more tour. But, um, uh, and again, as we've been moving people in, we, we suddenly had to move servers and storage into, into this room, but it wasn't here before. Let me sneak over here and I'll, I'll take on a little history tour. So we uh, uh, start with things like uh, my first games were written in the 1970s on spools of paper tape. So this is D&D 1, the very prequel to Ultima. And I wrote D&D 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through 28 
on a teletype that you'll see a teletype back down the hallway wherever we were. Um, then when the Apple II came out, I wrote D&D 28B, it actually says on there, and that became a Calabeth. This is literally the code for a Calabeth, and that's what's in these tubes, is the code for a Calabeth. And you can see how the underlying code, which was really this code, uh, had a, kind of a top-down ASCII representation of the world, and then I added the 3D graphics into what became a Calabeth, and then eventually became Ultima, but Ultima's original name was actually not Ultima, it was Ultimatum. And, uh, but since that was not trademarkable, the publisher I was working with shortened it to, uh, to Ultima. Um, this is the first way I produced a Calabeth, uh, handmade myself, including it was originally on cassette tape, and uh, just before I released it, uh, the floppy disk came out. And I only sold, this is like number 12, so I only sold you know, a dozen or so of these in its original form uh, before this company, California Pacific, uh, decided to you know, ask if they could distribute it nationally. Uh, they put it in a bigger Ziploc bag. They raised the price from $20 to $35. Uh, I actually didn't really care for their artwork very, well, very much. No kidding. Yeah, and so I actually uh, <laughs> went and hired a friend of mine, Dennis Lubay, who has created all of the Ultima covers since, all except Ultima 2. Um, and uh, but anyway, they, with this packaging at $35, they sold uh, 30,000 of these. My royalties were $5 a unit. If you do that math, that's $150,000 while I was a high school senior. Wow. Uh, so that, that's what really set this all up. So well, well now, now hang on, hang on. I want to leave this up to the fans because I think you're being unfair. What? You might be being a little unfair when it comes to the artwork here. Hang on, okay. this versus this. Okay, now, okay. Yeah. fans at home, when you post comments, I let you know history. History has already decided, maybe, but maybe in an alternate universe, what do you think? <laughs> a. Welcome, foolish mortal, into the world of Akalabeth with the. It looks like my four-year-old nephew would have drawn this. A little demon and, there and boobies. And with man, man as, boobs. and boobies and or, I guess if you like that kind of thing, the gigantic hulking 1980s metal cover <laughs> demon. Fighting a sorcerer, exactly, guy. Exactly. I guess. If you and like it was that. the '80s, by the way. So you know, the kind of thing I would have had painted on my van. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, then uh, he did uh, not only the Ultima, this is the Ultima original artwork, Ultima One's original artwork. Uh, this was Ultima Two that I published through uh, California Pacific. Uh, eventually became Sierra. Uh, excuse me, that was California Pacific. This is Sierra Online, or Online, and then became Sierra. Uh, then we formed Origin. This is our first ad for Origin back in the day. Uh, our first product with Origin was Ultima 3. That's the original Ultima 3 artwork. The original Ultima 4 artwork, which I still think is one of the best Ultimas. Yeah. Uh, Ultima 5, which actually is a game design. I think Ultima 5 was a better designed game, mm -hmm. although less kind of noteworthy, I think, than 4. Mm. Uh, something that Joseph and I were talking about yesterday, which is, uh, uh, you'll notice there's two versions of this cover. Uh, with the Avatar and Shamino. Yeah, that one doesn't have to. This one has no Shamino, and this was because in Japan they were upset about the blood. They weren't sure that they could ship this magic arrow and a little bit of blood, you know, to really? uh, children of Japan for some reason. So huh. that's the Japanese alternative cover. Then my favorite cover of all Ultimas, Ultima Six, uh, the False Prophet, and uh, this is also one of my favorites. Uh, uh, at least in the story standpoint, the fact that you know you're kind of set up to assume these are the bad guys who are invading Britannia, and in fact, uh, you know they're they're a fully realized uh, you know, race and culture that you should uh, not commit genocide through, in spite of their evil appearance. Uh, well, then Ultima Seven, which is from a world craft standpoint, I think that's my favorite Ultima. Yeah. Uh, and then we have to skip past the new uh, server pile. Well, I mean, this is where. I, this is what Ultima Six is where I found the games really started getting really, really striking covers. To where the point, I mean, with with the uh, the false prophet, you had yep. this actually kind of disturbing image, yep. where you've got this murdered guy on there. You know, yeah, yeah. games doesn't have that nowadays. Yeah. I don't know, maybe. Then you had this black, just sheer black. Right. I mean, how much more black could it be? Yeah. None. None. None more black. And so, and then, well, and and by the way, I even with Ultima Eight. The original cover had a pentagram on the front of it. So yeah, I actually I can't find even even I don't the have, red the, just the flames and the yes, pentagram. Even I don't have one of the original posters for the original way that Ultimate was, because uh, we had places like uh, uh, Walmart that wouldn't take the box uh, yeah. with the pentagram on the front. I'm going like, come on, get over it, guys. But 
Anyway, so we made them versions without. Yeah, because my mom, you know, I was old enough to buy my own games, but my mom was still going with me because I still live with my mom. She looked at me, I was looking at this game, and she's like, really? <laughs> and I'm like... It, it must be evil. It's, no, uh, well, she's, she just sees this game I'm playing, and she's like... Yeah. You know, I'm playing like, D&D isn't satanic, Mom. Oh, by the way, yeah, I'd like really, to... Here, give me this pentagram on the cover. But, uh, <laughs> but then my, you know, so this is for Ultima 9. Uh, you know, I felt really, oh, that's really funny. There's, uh, anyway, some markings on, some game design markings on the outside of the glass. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, but, but then, you know, I, one of the things I really liked about the, kind of the journey of all this is all the little swag, like the, you know, onks and the kind of leather-covered books were all written fictionally and... Yeah. The hand signed certificates and the virtue cards and things that I think you know really made the the reality of the experience begin the moment you had anything in your hands. And that's again what we're going to be doing here with Shroud of the Avatar is making sure that we fully realize the the reality of the game starting from the first thing you have contact with that we can provide you. And we're going to try to provide people all the swag, even if we're even if we don't have a much of a retail presence because we're going to be doing mm -hmm. additionally digital download. We'll make sure that people can get, you know, cloth maps and everything as well. And then, of course, uh, UO, um, which uh, you know became another you know watershed event in the sense of this game, which we had so much trouble getting this game made. Yeah. No one believed that this game was going to work, that this game could sell at all, and so uh, uh, it was it was a life and death struggle to to get permission to make this game. Uh, and then finally, when we finished it, you know, it outsold all the other games we've ever done, you know, ten times over. Still going on. Still going on to and this day. Not many games can say that. I mean, yeah. yeah. But the thing I like about it is, it's you know, it's a it's a it's a history that goes back, uh, you know, literally to the beginning. Yeah. You know, um, you know, teletypes. Well, there's a teletype down here at the end. You know, the uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, just like that's my original Apple II. That you know those tele that the spools of paper tape were in a machine like this, and I bought this one on eBay because which I had to look for for 20 years before I actually found one. Um, but but this is just like the one that I used uh, to write my first 28 you know, role playing games on, and uh, uh, and they really were Ultima prequels. I mean they they were you know uh, top down ASCII graphics instead of graphical tiles, but otherwise. You know, metaphorically, you know, uh, as close as you could do with the extraordinarily limited machines of the, mm -hmm. of the time.